This is the story of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Perhaps the most remarkable, certainly the most successful book ever to come out of the great publishing corporations of Ursa Minor. More popular than the Celestial Home Care Omnibus, better selling than 53 More Things to Do in Zero Gravity, and more controversial than Ulan Kalufid's trilogy of philosophical blockbusters, Where God Went Wrong, Some More of God's Greatest Mistakes, and Who Is This God Person Anyway? And in many of the more relaxed civilizations on the outer eastern rim of the galaxy, the Hitchhiker's Guide has already supplanted the great Encyclopedia Galactica as the standard repository of all knowledge and wisdom, because although it has many omissions, contains much that is apocryphal, or at least wildly inaccurate, it scores over the older, more pedestrian work in two important ways. First, it is slightly cheaper, and second, it has the words don't panic, inscribed in large, friendly letters on the cover. To tell the story of the book, it is best to tell the story of some of the minds behind it. A human from the planet Earth was one of them, though as our story opens, he no more knows his destiny than a tea leaf knows the history of the East India Company. His name is Arthur Dent. He is a six-foot-tall ape descendant, and someone is trying to drive a bypass through his home. Come off it, Mr. Dent. You can't win, you know. You can't lie in front of the bulldozers indefinitely. I'm game. We'll see who rusts first. Well, I'm afraid you're going to have to accept it. This bypass has got to be built, and it's going to be built. Nothing you can say... Or Why has it got to be built? Well, it's... What do you mean? Why has it got to be built? It's a bypass. You've got to build bypasses. Didn't anyone consider the alternatives? There are no alternatives. You, you were quite entitled to make any suggestions or protests at the appropriate time. Appropriate time? The first I knew about it was when a workman arrived at the door yesterday. Oh. I asked him if he'd come to clean the windows, and he said he'd come to demolish the house. Yes. He didn't tell me straight away, of course. Oh, no. First he wiped a couple of windows and charged me a fiver, and then he told me... But, Mr. Dent, the plans have been available in the planning office for the last nine months. <laughs> yes. I went straight round to find them yesterday afternoon. You hadn't exactly gone out of your way to call much attention to them, had you? I mean, like, actually telling anybody or anything. The plans were on display. On display? I eventually had to go down to the cellar. That's the display department. With a torch. Well, the lights had probably gone. So are the stairs. You found the notice, didn't you? Oh, yes. It was on display in the bottom of a locked filing cabinet, stuck in a disused lavatory with a sign on the door saying, Beware of the leopard. Mr. Dent! Hello, yes! Have you any idea how much damage that bulldozer would suffer if I just let it roll straight over you? How much? None at all. By a strange coincidence, none at all is exactly how much suspicion the ape descendant Arthur Dent had that one of his closest friends was not descended from an ape, but was in fact from a small planet somewhere in the vicinity of Betelgeuse. Arthur Dent's failure to suspect this reflects the care with which his friend blended himself into human society after a fairly shaky start. When he first arrived 15 years ago, the minimal research he had done suggested to him that the name Ford Prefect would be nicely inconspicuous. He will enter our story in 17.2 seconds and say, Hello, Arthur. The ape descendant will greet him in return. But in deference to a million years of evolution, he will not attempt to pick fleas off him. Earthmen are not proud of their ancestors and never invite them round to dinner. Hello, Arthur. No, oh, Ford, hi, how are you? Fine. Look, are you busy? Well, I've just got this bulldozer to lie in front of, otherwise, no, not especially. Good. What? Look, there's a pub down the road. Let's have a pint and we can talk. Ford, there's a man over there who wants to knock my house down. Arthur. The first I knew about Arthur. it was yesterday when a workman Arthur. came around to say he was cleaning the windows. What? Arthur, just listen to me. I have got to tell you the most important thing you've ever heard. I've got to tell you now, and I've got to tell you in that pub there. Why? Because you're going to need a very stiff drink. Just trust me. But you don't understand. Arthur. These Arthur. are trying to Arthur. Arthur. Right. You know you can trust me to the end of the earth. Yes, but how far is that? About ten minutes away. Come on, I need a drink. The Encyclopedia Galactica describes alcohol as a colourless, volatile liquid formed by the fermentation of sugars, and also notes its intoxicating effect on certain carbon-based life forms. 
the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy also mentions alcohol. It says that the best drink in existence is the pan-galactic gargle blaster, the effect of which is like having your brains smashed out with a slice of lemon wrapped round a large gold brick. The guide also tells you on which planets the best pan-galactic gargle blasters are mixed, how much you can expect to pay for one, and what voluntary organizations exist to help you rehabilitate. The man who invented this mind-pummeling drink also invented the wisest remark ever made, which was this. Never drink more than two pan-galactic gargle blasters unless you are a 30-ton elephant with bronchial pneumonia. His name is Zephod Beeblebrox, and we shall learn more of his wisdom later. Six pints of bitter, and quickly, please, the world's about to end. Oh, yes, sir. Nice weather for him. Can you watch the match this afternoon, sir? No, no point. Foregone conclusion, that, you reckon, sir? Arsenal without a chance? No, it's just that the world's going to end. Oh, yes, sir, you said. Lucky escape for Arsenal if it did. No, not really. Oh, sir. Six pints. Right, uh, keep the change. From a fiver? Thank you, sir. You've only got seven minutes left to spend it. Oh, Ford, would you please tell me what the hell is going on? Drink up, you've got three pints to get through. Three at lunchtime? Time is an illusion. Lunchtime doubly so. Drink up. Why three pints? Muscle relaxant. You'll need it. Did I do something wrong today, or has the world always been like this and I've been too wrapped up in myself to notice? I'll try to explain. Drink up. How long have we known each other? Five years, maybe six. Most of it seemed to make some kind of sense at the time. All right. How would you react if I said that I'm not from Guildford after all? but from a small planet somewhere in the vicinity of Beetlejuice. I don't know. Why, do you think it's the sort of thing you feel you're likely to say? Drink up. The world's about to end. This must be Thursday. I never could get the hang of Thursdays. On this particular Thursday, things were moving quietly through the ionosphere many miles above the surface of the planet. Several huge yellow slab-like somethings, huge as office blocks, silent as birds, which hung in the air exactly the same way that bricks don't. The planet was almost totally unaware of their presence. They went unnoticed at Goonhilly, they passed over Cape Canaveral without a blip, and Woomera and Jodrell Bank looked straight through them, which was a pity, because it was exactly the sort of thing they'd been looking for all these years. Arthur, of course, was totally unaware of them. He was only aware of a sudden, terrible crashing noise. What's that? Don't worry, they haven't started yet. Good. It's probably just your house being knocked down. What? Three minutes to go. Damn you and your fairy stories. They're smashing up my home. Stop, you vandals, you home wreckers, you half -brain. Arthur, come back. It's pointless. Oh. Hell. You better go after him. Uh, barman, quickly, can you just give me four packets of peanuts? Certainly, sir. There you are, sir. 28 pence. Keep the change. Are you serious, sir? I mean, uh, do you really think the world's going to end this afternoon? Yes, in just over one minute and 35 seconds. Well, uh, isn't there anything we can do? No, nothing. Well, I always thought we were meant to lie down or put a paper bag over our head or something. If you like, yes. Will that help? No. Excuse me, I've got to find my friend. Oh, well then. Last orders, please! You bitch!
there's no point in acting all surprised about it. All the planning charts and demolition orders have been on display at your local planning department in Alpha Centauri for 50 of your Earth years. So you've had plenty of time to lodge any formal complaints. And it's far too late to start making a fuss about it now. What do you mean you've never been to Alpha Centauri? Oh, for heaven's sake, mankind, it's only four light years away, you know. I'm sorry, but if you can't be bothered to take an interest in local affairs, that's your own lookout. Energize the demolition beams. Oh, I don't know. That pathetic bloody planet. I haven't listened to them at all. never been through a matter transference beam before, you've probably lost some salt and protein. The beer you had should have cushioned your system a bit. How are you feeling? Like a military academy. Bits of me keep on passing out. If I asked where the hell we were, would I regret it? We're safe. Oh, good. We're in a small galley cabin in one of the spaceships of the Vogon Constructor Fleet. Ah, this is obviously some strange usage of the word safe that I wasn't previously aware of. I'll have a look for the light. How did we get here? We hitched a lift. Excuse me. Are you trying to tell me that we just stuck out our thumbs and some green, bug-eyed monster stuck his head out and said, Hi, fellas, hop right in. I can take you as far as the Basingstoke roundabout. Well, the thumb's an electronic sub-ether device. The roundabout's at Barnard Star six light years away, but otherwise, that's more or less right. And the bug-eyed monster? It's green, yes. Fine. When can I go home? You can't. Ah, found the light. Good grief. Is this really the interior of a flying saucer? It certainly is. What do you think? It's a bit squalid, isn't it? What did you expect? Well, I don't know. Gleaming control panels, flashing lights, computer screens. Not old mattresses. Here, have a look at this. What is it? The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. It's a sort of electronic book. It'll tell you everything you want to know. That's its job. I like the cover. Don't panic. It's the first helpful or intelligible thing anybody's said to me all day. That's why it sells so well. Here, press this button and the screen will give you the index. Right now, now fast wind through to V. There you are. Bogon Constructor Fleets. Now, enter that code on the tabulator and read what it says. Vogon Constructor Fleets. Here is what to do if you want to get a lift from a Vogon. Forget it. They are one of the most unpleasant races in the galaxy. Not actually evil, but bad-tempered, bureaucratic, officious and callous. They wouldn't even lift a finger to save their own grandmothers from the ravenous bug bladder beast of trial without orders signed in triplicate, sent in, sent back, queried, lost, found, subjected to public inquiry, lost again, and finally buried in soft peat for three months and recycled as fire lighters. The best way to get a drink out of a Vogon is stick your finger down his throat. And the best way to irritate him is to feed his grandmother to the ravenous bug bladder beast of trial. What a strange book. But how did we get a lift, then? The Dentrassi let us on board. I thought you said they were called Bogons. Vogons. Ah, not Dentrassi. No, no. The Dentrassi are the in-flight caterers. Great guys. They're the best cooks and the best drinks mixers, and they don't give a wet slap about anything else. And they always help hitchhikers. Partly because they like the company, but mostly because it annoys the Vogons. Which is exactly what you need to know if you're a penniless hitchhiker trying to see the marvels of the galaxy for less than 30 Altarian dollars a day. But the book doesn't even mention them. Ah, it's not very accurate. I'm researching the new edition. That's my job. Fun, isn't it? It's amazing. Unfortunately, I got stuck on the Earth for rather longer than I intended. I came for a week and was stranded for 15 years. But how did you get there in the first place? Oh, I got a lift with a teaser. Teaser? You know, rich kids with nothing to do. They cruise around looking for planets which haven't made interstellar contact yet and buzz them. Buzz them? Yes. They find some isolated spot, then land right by some poor unsuspecting soul whom no one's ever going to believe, and then strut up and down in front of him wearing silly antennae on their heads and making meek meek noises. <laughs> Rather childish, really. Right. 
What the devil's that? Listen, it might be important. It's the Vogon captain making an announcement on the PA. But I can't speak Vogon. You don't need to. Just put this fish in your mouth. What? <laughs> it's only a little one. Yeah. Have a good time. Message repeat. This is your captain speaking, so stop whatever you're doing and pay attention. First of all, I see from our instruments that we have a couple of hitchhikers aboard our ship. Hello. Hello, wherever you are. I just want to make it totally clear that you are not at all welcome. I worked hard to get where I am today, and I did become captain of a Vogon constructor ship simply so that I could turn it into a taxi service for degenerate freeloaders. I have sent out a search party, and as soon as they find you, I will put you off the ship. If you're very lucky, I might read you some of my poetry at first. Secondly, we are about to jump into hyperspace for the journey to Barnard Star. On arrival, we will stay in dock for a 72-hour refit, and no one's to leave the ship during that time. I repeat, all planet leave is cancelled. I've just had an unhappy love affair, so I don't see why anyone else should have a good time. Message ends. Charming, these bogons. I wish I had a daughter so I could forbid her to marry one. You wouldn't need to. They've got as much sex appeal as a road accident. Oh, and you better be prepared for the jump into hyperspace. It's unpleasantly like being drunk. Well, what's unpleasant about being drunk? You ask a glass of water. Ford? Yes? What's this fish doing in my ear? Translating for you. Look under Babel fish in the book. Whoa, what's happening? We're going into hyperspace. Ah. I'll never be cruel to a gin and tonic again. The Babel fish is small, yellow, leech-like, and probably the oddest thing in the universe. It feeds on brainwave energy, absorbing all unconscious frequencies and then excreting telepathically a matrix formed from the conscious frequencies and nerve signals picked up from the speech centers of the brain. The practical upshot of which is that if you stick one in your ear, you can instantly understand anything sent to you in any form of language. The speech you hear decodes the brainwave matrix. Now, it is such a bizarrely improbable coincidence that anything so mind-bogglingly useful could evolve purely by chance that some thinkers have chosen to see it as a final, clinching proof of the non-existence of God. The argument goes something like this. I refuse to prove that I exist, says God, for proof denies faith, and without faith I am nothing. But, says man, the Babel fish is a dead giveaway, isn't it? It proves you exist, therefore you don't. QED. Oh dear, says God, I hadn't thought of that, and promptly vanishes in a puff of logic. Oh, that was easy, says man, and for an encore he proves that black is white, and gets killed on the next zebra crossing. Most leading theologians claim that this argument is a load of dingo's kidneys, but that didn't stop Ulan Kalufid making a small fortune when he used it as the central theme of his best-selling book, well, that about wraps it up for God. Meanwhile, the poor Babelfish, by effectively removing all barriers of communication between different cultures and races, has caused more and bloodier wars than anything else in the history of creation. What an extraordinary book. Did you get much useful material on Earth? I was able to extend the entry, yes. Oh, let's see what it says in this edition, then. OK. Let's see. E, Earth, about the code, S, page. Oh, it doesn't seem to have an entry. Yes, it does. Look, there, at the bottom of the screen. Under Eccentrica Columbus, the triple-breasted whore of Eroticon 6. What, there? Oh, yes. Harmless? Is that all it's got to say? One word? Harmless? What the hell's that supposed to mean? Well, there are a hundred billion stars in the galaxy and a limited amount of space in the book. And no one knew much about the Earth. Well, I hope you've managed to rectify that a bit. Yes, I transmitted a new entry off to the editor. Good. He had to trim it a bit, but it's still an improvement. What does it say now? Mostly harmless. Mostly harmless? Oh, come on. I think that's pretty good coverage for a disintegrated pile of rubble. And that's supposed to make me feel better, is it? Shh! What? That. What is it? Well, if we're lucky, it's just the Vogons come to throw us into space. And if we're unlucky? The captain might want to read us some of his poetry first. Vogon poetry is, of course, the third worst in the universe. The second worst is that of the Asgoths of Crea. During a recitation by their poet master, Grunthus the Flatulent, of his poem, Ode to a Small Lump of Green Putty I Found in My Armpit One Midsummer Morning, four of his audience died of internal hemorrhaging, 
and the president of the Mid-Galactic Arts Nobbling Council only survived by gnawing one of his own legs off. Granthas is reported to have been disappointed by the poem's reception and was about to embark on a reading of his 12-book epic entitled Zen and the Art of Going to the Lavatory when his own major intestine, in a desperate attempt to save the universe, leapt straight up through his neck and throttled his brain. The very worst poetry of all perished along with its creator, Paul Normal E. Milne, of Redbridge, Essex, England, in the destruction of the planet Earth. Vogon poetry is mild by comparison, but when the Vogon captain began to read, it provoked this reaction from Ford Prefect. And this from Arthur Dent. <laughs> <laughs> oh, freckled grunt bugly, <coughs> thy micturations are to me as purdled gabble blotting <coughs> in a lurky Group, I implore thee, <coughs> my hooting curling drones, and hoopsiously strangle me with crinkly bindle words. For otherwise, I will rend thee in the gobble water with my burgle crunching. See if I don't. So, earthlings, I present you with a simple choice. I was going to throw you straight out into the empty blackness of space to die horribly and slowly, but there is one way, one simple way, in which you may save yourselves. Think very carefully, for you hold your very lives in your hands. Now, choose. Either die in the vacuum of space, or... Tell me how good you thought my poem was. Oh, I, I thought that some of the metaphysical imagery was really particularly effective. Uh, yes, yes, and interesting rhythmic devices, too, which seem to counterpoint, yeah, counterpoint the, uh... the, the, the... the surrealism of the underlying metaphor. And then die in the vacuum of space. What? Now, wait a minute. I'm sorry if that seems mean, but it's the only thing I'm much good at, so I like to keep in practice. What, writing poetry? No, being mean. God. Take them to number three airlock and throw them out. Ah. No, don't worry, Arthur. I'll think of something. I don't want to die now. I've still got a headache. I, I don't want to go to heaven with a headache. I'd be all cross and wouldn't enjoy it. Ow! Ow! I come to point the surrealism of the underlying metaphor. Oh. Death's too good for them. <laughs> Far out in the uncharted backwaters of the unfashionable end of the western spiral arm of the galaxy lies a small, unregarded yellow sun. Orbiting this at a distance of roughly 90 million miles is an utterly insignificant little blue-green planet whose ape-descended life forms are so amazingly primitive that they still think digital watches are a pretty neat idea. This planet has, or had, a problem which was this most of the people living on it were unhappy for pretty much of the time. Many solutions were suggested for this problem, but most of these were largely concerned with the movements of small green pieces of paper. Which is odd, because on the whole, it wasn't the small green pieces of paper that were unhappy. And so the problem remained. And lots of the people were mean, and most of them were miserable, even the ones with digital watches. Many were increasingly of the opinion that they'd all made a big mistake in coming down from the trees in the first place. And some said that even the trees had been a bad move and that no one should ever have left the oceans. And then one day, nearly 2,000 years after one man had been nailed to a tree for saying how great it would be to be nice to people for a change, a girl, sitting on her own in a small cafe in Rickmansworth, suddenly realised what it was that had been going wrong all this time and she finally knew how the world could be made a good and happy place. This time it was right, it would work, and no one would have to get nailed to anything. Sadly, however, before she could get to a phone to tell anyone, the Earth was unexpectedly demolished to make way for a new hyperspace bypass, and so the idea was lost forever. Meanwhile, Arthur Dent and Ford Prefect have escaped from all that, only to have to contend with all this. We're trapped now, aren't we? Uh, 
Yes, we're trapped. Well, didn't you think of anything? Oh, yes, but unfortunately, it rather involved being on the other side of the airtight hatchway they've just sealed behind us. So what happens next? The hatchway in front of us will open automatically in a moment, and we'll shoot out into deep space and asphyxiate in about 30 seconds. So this is it. We're going to die. Yes. Except... No. Wait a minute. What's this switch? What? Where? No. I was only fooling. We are going to die after all. No, it's at times like this when I'm trapped in a Vogon airlock with a man from Beetlejuice and about to die of asphyxiation in deep space that I really wish I'd listened to what my mother told me when I was young. Why? What did she tell you? I don't know. I didn't listen. Tell me. The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy is a truly remarkable book. The introduction starts like this. Space, it says, is big, really big. You just won't believe how vastly, hugely, mind-bogglingly big it is. I mean, you may think it's a long way down the street to the chemist, but that's just peanuts to space. Listen. And so on. After a while, the style settles down a bit and it starts telling you things you actually need to know. Like the fact that the fabulously beautiful planet Beth Silliman is now so worried about the cumulative erosion caused by 10 billion visiting tourists a year that any net imbalance between the amount you eat and the amount you excrete whilst on the planet is surgically removed from your body weight when you leave. So every time you go to the lavatory there, it is vitally important to get a receipt. In the entry in which it talks about dying of asphyxiation 30 seconds after being thrown out of a spaceship, it goes on to say that what with space being the size it is, the chances of being picked up by another craft within those seconds are 2 to the power of 267,709 to 1 against, which by a staggering coincidence was also the telephone number of an Islington flat where Arthur once went to a very good party and met a very nice girl whom he totally failed to get off with. Though the planet Earth, the Islington flat and the telephone have all now been demolished, it is comforting to reflect that they are in some small way commemorated by the fact that 29 seconds later Ford and Arthur were in fact rescued. something? Oh, yeah, sure. Great idea of mine to find a passing spaceship and get rescued by. Oh, come on. The chances against it are astronomical. Don't knock it. It worked. Now, where are we? Well, I hardly like to say this, but it looks like the seafront at South End. God, I'm relieved to hear you say that. Why? Because I thought I must be going mad. Perhaps you are. Perhaps you only thought I said it. Well, did you say it or not? I think so. Perhaps we're both going mad. Still, nice day for it. Sunshine, sea. Candy Blossom. Thank you. Perhaps we better ask someone what's going on. How about that man over there? What, the one with the five heads crawling up the wall? Uh, yes. Um, excuse me. <laughs> if this is South End, then there's something very odd about it. You mean the way the sea stays steady as a rock and the buildings keep washing up and down? Yes, I thought that was odd. Two to the power of 100,000 to one against it. Falling. Falling. What was that? Sounds like a measurement of probability. Or improbability. Improbability. Everything seems to be melting away. Falling backward. The stars are swirling. A dust bowl. Snow. My legs drifting off into the sunset. My left arm floating away. How am I going to operate my digital watch now? Ford? Yes. You're turning into a penguin. Stop it. Two to the power of 75,000 to one against and falling. Hey, who are you? Where are you? What's going on and is there any way of stopping it? Please relax. You're perfectly safe. That's not the point. The point is that I'm now a perfectly safe penguin and my colleague here is rapidly running out of limbs. That's all right. I've got them back now. Two to the power of 
50,000 to one against and falling. Admittedly, they're longer than I usually like them. But Isn't there, there anything you feel you ought to be telling us? Welcome to the Starship Heart of Gold. Please do not be alarmed by anything you see or hear around you. You are bound to feel some initial ill effects as you have been rescued from certain death at an improbability level of 2 to the power of 267,709 to 1 against, possibly much higher. We are now cruising at a level of 2 to the power of 25,000 to 1 against and falling, and we'll be restoring normality as soon as we're sure what is normal anyway. Thank you. 2 to the power of 20,000 to 1 against and falling. Arthur, this is fantastic. We've been picked up by a ship with the new infinite improbability drive. I mean, this is really incredible, Arthur. Arthur? What's happening? Ford, there's an infinite number of monkeys outside who want to talk to us about this script for Hamlet they've worked out. The infinite improbability drive is a wonderful new method of crossing interstellar distances in a few seconds without all that tedious mucking about in hyperspace. The principle of generating small amounts of finite improbability by simply hooking the logic circuits of a Bambleweenie 57 sub meson brain to an atomic vector plotter suspended in a strong Brownian motion producer, say a nice hot cup of tea, were of course well understood, and such generators were often used to break the ice at parties by making all the molecules in the hostess's undergarments simultaneously leap one foot to the left in accordance with the theory of indeterminacy. Many respectable physicists said that they weren't going to stand for that sort of thing, partly because it was a debasement of science, but mostly because they didn't get invited to those sort of parties. Another thing they couldn't stand was the perpetual failure they encountered in trying to construct a machine which could generate the infinite improbability field needed to flip a spaceship between the furthest stars, and in the end, they grumpily announced that such a machine was virtually impossible. Then one day, a student, who had been left to sweep up the lab after a particularly unsuccessful party, found himself reasoning this way. If such a machine is a virtual impossibility, then it must logically be a finite improbability. So all I have to do in order to make one is to work out exactly how improbable it is, then feed that figure into the finite improbability generator, give it a fresh cup of really hot tea, and turn it on. He did this, and was rather startled to discover that he had managed to create the long sought after infinite improbability generator out of thin air. It startled him even more when just after he was awarded the Galactic Institute's prize for extreme cleverness, he got lynched by a rampaging mob of respectable physicists who had finally realized that the one thing they really couldn't stand was a smart ass. Five to one against and falling, four to one against and falling, three to one, two, one, probability factor of one to one. We have normality. I repeat, we have normality. Anything you still can't cope with is therefore your own problem. Please relax, you'll be sent for soon. Who are they, Trillian? Just a couple of guys you picked up in open space. Sector ZZ9, plural Z Alpha. Yeah, well, that's a very sweet thought, Trillian, but do you really think it wise under the circumstances? I mean, here we are, on the run and everything. We've got the police of half the galaxy after us, and we stop to pick up hitchhikers. Okay, so uh, ten out of ten for style, but minus several million for good thinking, eh? I didn't pick them up. The ship did it all by itself. What? Whilst we're in improbability drive. Oh, that's incredible. No, just very, very improbable. Look, don't worry about the aliens. They're just a couple of guys, I expect. I'll send the robot down to check them out. Hey, Marvin. I think you ought to know I'm feeling very depressed. Oh, God. Well, here's something to occupy you and keep your mind off things. It won't work. I have an exceptionally large mind. Marvin. All right, what do you want me to do? Go down to number two entry bay and bring the two aliens up here under surveillance. Just that. I won't enjoy it. She's not asking you to enjoy it. Just do it, will you? All right, I'll do it. Good. Great. Thank you. I'm not getting you down at all, am I? No, no, Marvin. That's just fine, really. I wouldn't like to think I was getting you down. No, don't you worry about that. You just act as comes naturally and everything will be fine. You're sure you don't mind? No, 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 no. It's all just part of life. Life. 
Don't talk to me about life. I don't think I can stand that robot much longer, Zaphod. The Encyclopedia Galactica defines a robot as a mechanical apparatus designed to do the work of a man. The marketing division of the Sirius Cybernetics Corporation defines a robot as your plastic pal who's fun to be with. The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy defines the marketing division of the Sirius Cybernetics Corporation as a bunch of mindless jerks who will be the first against the wall when the revolution comes with a footnote to the effect that the editors would welcome applications from anyone interested in taking over the post of robotics correspondent. Curiously enough, an edition of the Encyclopedia Galactica that fell through a time warp from a thousand years in the future defined the marketing division of the Sirius Cybernetics Corporation as a bunch of mindless jerks who were the first against the wall when the revolution came. I think this ship is brand new, Arthur. How can you tell? Have you got some exotic device for measuring the age of metal? No, I just found this sales brochure lying on the floor. The universe can be yours. Yes, look. Sensational new breakthrough in improbability physics. As the ship's drive reaches infinite improbability, it passes through every conceivable point in every conceivable universe almost simultaneously. Mm. You select your own re-entry point. Be the envy of other major governments. This is big league stuff. It looks a hell of a lot better than that dingy Vogon ship. This is my idea of a spaceship. It's all gleaming white, flashing lights, everything. What happens if I press this button? I wouldn't. Oh. What happened? A sign lit up saying, please do not press this button again. They make a big thing of the ship's cybernetics. A new generation of serious cybernetics corporation robots and computers with the new GPP feature. GPP? What's that? Uh, it says genuine people personalities. Ah, ghastly. Thank you. It is. What? Ghastly. It all is absolutely ghastly. Just don't even talk about it. Look, Look at this door. All the doors in this spacecraft have a cheerful and sunny disposition. It is their pleasure to open for you and their satisfaction to close again with the knowledge of a job well done. Thank you. Hateful. Come on. I've been ordered to take you up to the bridge. Here I am, brain the size of a planet, and they tell me to take you up to the bridge. Call that job satisfaction, because I don't. Uh, excuse me, which government owns this ship? You watch this door. It's about to open again. I can tell by the intolerable air of smugness it suddenly generates. Thank you. Come on. Thank you. Thank you, the marketing division of the Sirius Cybernetics Corporation. Which government owns this ship? Let's build robots with genuine people personalities, they said. So they tried it out with me. I'm a personality prototype. You can tell, can't you? Uh, well, I hate that door. I'm not getting you down, am I? Which government owns no it? No government owns it. It's been stolen. Stolen? Stolen. stolen. Who by? Zaphod Beeblebrox. Zaphod Beeblebrox? Oh, sorry, did I say something wrong? Pardon me for breathing, which I never do anyway, so I don't know why I bother to say it. Oh, God, I'm so depressed. Here's another of those self-satisfied doors. Life is service. Life. Don't talk to me about life. No one even mentioned it. Really? Safe on people. News reports brought to you here on the sub Wave Waveband, broadcasting around the galaxy, around the clock. And we'll be saying a big hello to all intelligent life forms everywhere. And to everyone else out there, the secret is to bang the rocks together, guys. And of course, the big news story tonight is the sensational theft of the new improbability drive prototype ship by none other than Safehard Beeblebrox. And the question everyone's asking is, has the big Z finally flipped? Beeblebrox, the man who invented the pan-galactic gargle blaster, ex trickster, part-time galactic president, once described by eccentric Columbus as the best bang since the big one, and recently voted the worst-dressed sentient being in the universe for the seventh time running. Has he got an answer this time? We asked his private brain care specialist, Gag Halford. Hey, look, Zephyr's just this guy, you know? What'd you turn it off for? I just thought of something. Yeah? We picked those couple of guys up in sector ZZ9, plural Z Alpha. Does that mean anything to you? On the whole, no. Let me show it to you on the screen. 
right there. It's the same sector you picked me up in. Hey, right. I don't believe it. How the hell do we come to be there? Improbability drive. We pass through every point in the universe. You know that. Yeah, but, but, but picking them up there is just too strange a coincidence. I want to work this out. Computer? Hi there. Oh, God. I want you to know that whatever your problem, I am here to help you solve it. Uh, look, I think I'll just use a piece of paper. Sure thing, I understand. If you ever need a... Shut up. Okay, okay. Trillion, listen. The ship picked them up all by itself, right? Right. So that already gives us a high improbability factor. I can work it out for you. It picked them up in that particular space sector. Sector ZZ9, plural Z Alpha. Which gives us another high improbability factor. Plus, they were not wearing space suits. Did you think of that? So we picked them up during a crucial 30-second period. I've got a note of that factor here. So have I. Put it all together. And we have a total improbability factor of exactly... Well, it's pretty vast, but it's not infinite. At what point did we pick them up? Infinite, infinite improbability, improbability level. level. Yeah. I got a bad feeling about one big whack of improbability still to be accounted for. Not with service. I suppose you'll want to see the aliens now. Do you want me to sit in a corner and rust, or just fall apart where I'm standing? Show them in, please, Marvin. I'm not staying in the same room with that robot. Ford, hi, how are you? Glad you could drop in. Say, Ford, great to see you. You're looking <laughs> well. <laughs> the extra arm suits you. Nice ship you've stolen. You mean you know this guy? Know him? He's... Oh, Zaphod. This is a friend of mine, Arthur Dent. I saved him when his planet blew up. Oh, sure. Hi, Arthur. Glad you could make it. And, Arthur, this is my... We've semi. met. What? Oh, uh, have we... Uh, uh, what do you mean, you've met? This is Zaphod Beeblebrox from Beetlejuice 5, you know, not bloody Martin Smith from Croydon. I don't care. We've met, haven't we, Zaphod? Or should I say... Phil. What? You'll have to remind me. I have a terrible memory for species. Hey, Ford. It was at a party six months ago. I rather doubt that. On Earth. Uh, England. <laughs> Look. London. Uh, Islington. Oh, 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 that party. Zay Ford, you don't mean to say you've been on that miserable little planet as well, do you? No, of course not. Well, well, I, I may just have uh, dropped in briefly on my way somewhere. He gatecrashed this fancy dress party, barged up to the girl I was talking to and said, Hey doll, is this guy boring you? Why don't you talk to me instead? I'm from a different planet. Zaphon? Yes, he only had the two arms and he called himself Phil, but there was absolutely... But you absolute... have to admit he did turn out to be from another planet. What? Good God! It's her, Trisha McMillan. In probability sum, now complete. And for my next trick, oh, I... Oh, just... shut up, will you? Uh, just trying to create a pleasant social atmosphere. What on earth are you doing here? Same as you, I hitched a lift. After all, with a degree in maths and another in astrophysics, it was either that or the dole queue again on Monday, wasn't it? Anyway, hi. Nice to see you again. But this is all impossible. No, just very, very improbable. Oh, God. Ford, this is Trillian. Hi. Trillian, this is my semi-cousin Ford, who shares three of the same mothers as me. Hi. Trillian, is this sort of thing going to happen every time we use the infinite improbability drive? Very probably, I'm afraid. Zaphod Beeblebrox, this is a very large drink. Hi there, this is Eddie, your shipboard computer. And I just want to mention here that we are now moving into orbit around the legendary planet of Magrathir. Uh, sorry to interrupt your social evening. Have a good time. <laughs>